right. Hello, people on Zoom. We're just going to start now, give a few minutes for people to file in. Oh, yeah, that's right. Because they kicked off. Division. So uh, for anyone who hasn't been in this building before, uh, I really encourage you to come downstairs after the talk, and I'll show you the geology division in the basement. Um, it's a very lovely collection. Uh, welcome everyone in person and on Zoom to the fourth and final of the Ruth Shaw Memorial Lecture Series. Uh, I want to speak, let's say a few words about Ruth Shaw. She was a longtime member of the Athol Burden Nature Club for over, over 30 years. She and her husband lived in Orange for that entire time. And she and her husband were very involved in making sure that the Athol Burden Nature Club Museum collection uh, survived and was kept intact and found a home in Orange near the uh, uh, Orange Town Hall Municipal Building uh, when it was moved out of the Athol Junior High School in 1988. Um, Ruth was very interested in geology. She had a lifelong passion for learning. Uh, she conducted, oh, she took part in many, many uh, geology field trips to places such as the Canadian Rockies, to Yellowstone, to Iceland, to the Caribbean. Um, she, her husband worked at Green, uh, Greenfield Community College as a uh, professor. And so she took every class in the geology, uh, every geology class offered at Greenfield Community College. Um, and she, on a personal note, she would, tell me every year when the Greenfield Community College uh, Rock and Mineral Show was coming up. She's very passionate about geology. Um, and she has a personal connection with Richard Little. And so I think it's very appropriate that he comes uh, and, and bookends this and uh, gives us the last lecture. Um, Richard Little is an emeritus professor at Greenfield Community College. Um, he, is the discoverer of the armored mud balls in the, in the Connecticut Valley. Um, and he's a passionate science advocate and educator. And you're in a, for a real treat. He gives excellent talks. I've heard, I've heard this one before. It's just, you're in for a real treat. So I will turn it over to Richard Little right now. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Max. It's great to be here today. Thanks. For coming out on such a, a beautiful winter day, right? I mean, is it winter? <laughs> okay, the older I get, the more I appreciate winters like this, but I've never seen one like this. I am so old. I remember when it was really cold in the winter time. Like, remember when you actually could never even think about wearing shorts in the winter? Anyway, uh, yeah, I know. I used to walk five miles to school through the snowdrifts. That's not true. <laughs> anyway, um, it, it's fun to get old because let me tell you, you have a perspective that most of the young people just don't have. They just don't have those things. So um, anyway, I also will not digress, <laughs> maybe. So ladies and gentlemen, you're going to know more about armored mud balls than anyone else in the world at this point after the end of the show. And there will be no test either. So that's the good part. So sit back, enjoy. Make sure you come up and touch an armored mud ball because there's no place in the world you can do this except right here in Franklin County. And besides that, it's even rarer to find a stone that actually has them, that, that's not one of the big quarried ones, you know, that has them preserved, that's actually small enough to find and bring in and go off. So this is extremely rare. I want you to appreciate it. And if we're really lucky, these will become a, an official state sedimentary structure. And you can learn more about that with some of the handouts here, uh, including this really cute cartoon, which I will reference again in my show tonight. But uh, I have a nephew who is a published graphic artist and he actually teaches in New York City. He got excited about armored mud balls and I was hoping he might just do one little panel, you know, that I could use on my armored mud ball talk showing, you know, an armored mud ball falling into a stream. He ended up doing the story. And I was absolutely, <laughs> absolutely blown away by the fact that he could do this one page summary of the whole armored football life. And, and okay. So I guess I should be here. Is that okay? Ah, okay. Thank you. 
I'm not used to being on television. Yeah, okay. So uh, if anybody wishes to get this that's in the audience tonight, not here, but virtual, you can go to my website. You can find this. You can download it yourself, or I'll send you a copy if you just contact me. Anyway, there's the cartoon of Armand, but in case you fall asleep. Here's the cartoon of the whole story tonight. And on the back, there's all the documentation that will help you investigate further. See, so if anybody wants to leave now, you can just grab one of these. And... <laughs> okay, so enough of the funny stuff. Let's just, uh, let's go on and talk about Armored Mud Balls tonight, this afternoon. And uh, once again, thank you so much for coming and learning about this today. And let's see if we can get this work. Slideshow. Slideshow, yes. There she is. Uh, there we go. There we go. All right. Yep. Okay. Uh, so there it is. Uh, it's kind of funny that the little caption says David Small, but I'm Richard Little. <laughs> let, me, uh, let me just. I got. Just in case that ever fools somebody, I don't know. Uh, so I, that, that, that's okay. Okay. All right, All right. Every, everyone able to see that huh? Yeah. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, here we go. Armored mud balls, rare, unique, and in the whole world, only in Franklin County. Yes. And let's see. Oh, uh, you know, sorry. You're right. I was I was doing the up and down. Yeah, left and right. Oh, left, right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So here we go. Uh, just a brief advertisement. I did write a couple books about the valley area here. The Exploring Franklin County book is out of print for a while. It's being um, revised. Um, should be out again this spring. And the Exploring, uh, excuse me, the Dinosaurs and Dunes book is available for only 10 bucks. And if anybody wants to know, that's less than the price to produce those these days. So there's a bargain for anybody that wants one. And I have a hat here. Now my dog is, uh, he's called Handsome actually. And this is what the breeder named him. He's a whippet, you know, like a small greyhound. And um, he was so pretty, the, the breeder called him Handsome. So that's Handsome, he's wearing the Armored Mudball hat. And then you have some free stuff here, postcards and um, bumper stickers. And I just did this new t-shirt because we need to get the word out about Armored Mud Ball. So if you can wear it, it means you're a supporter, right? There it is, show your colors. <laughs> and anyway, um, they are indeed at cost at $25 when you handle, when you factor in the shipping. So if anybody wants those, that's available. And there's the free cartoon page. And this even has Handsome the Whippet in the cartoon right over there. Isn't that just so cute? <laughs> um, so anyway, I did want to say that now I'm old, pushing 80, and the only driver in my household now, I want to be extra COVID safe. So social distance around me, if you would. Thank you very much. I know you will all, all do that. And so back to the program. So armored mud balls, once again, rare, unique in the whole world. Are they really? Let's answer those questions. First of all, formation, armored mud ball. Mud, that's in the armored mud ball, right? You start with the mud, falls into a stream. And as it tumbles down the stream, it gets round, sticky on the outside, and then pebbles from the stream bed adhere to the outside of that rolling ball. That's what we call the armor. See, they, they get armored by the pebbles and that actually protects the mud. Once you can armor them, you see the mud ball becomes much more um, resistant to erosion. But next you need a quick burial. So as the mud ball goes down the stream, it has to be deposited and buried quickly. And then it has to be turned to stone in geology. We call that lithification. So it has to be buried deep enough and long enough so it could be turned to stone along with all the other sand and gravel around it, of course. And this means that it gets buried, right? So these things were buried deep in the ground by thousands of feet anyway. And then you have to have, to see them today, you have to have them uplifted. You have to have the region uplifted. And then you have to have some erosion so that 
those rocks that were lithified thousands of feet down can be seen at the surface today. Now you need a rock quarry. The rock quarry has to be in just the right spot so it can cut into those uplifted and eroded rocks and take chunks out. And then of course they have to go someplace where somebody can find them. <laughs> and guess what? That happened to be me. I happened to be there when I first got my job at Greenfield Community College decades ago now. I happened to find these and the story for that is coming. So um, this is my fame and fortune. It's armored mud balls. And it turns out they're extremely rare, just like I'm going to tell you. And I want to make sure that everybody in Massachusetts has a chance to appreciate this and protect them beyond my lifetime on earth here, right? Because, you know, once I'm gone, who's gonna be out here lecturing on armored mud balls? Probably nobody, but if they become a state recognized structure, then people will know about them. Anyway, that's my goal. So where can you see these beautiful things? They're round, they're photogenic. Look at the armor that's just stuck in this one, surrounded by pebbles and sand. Uh, where can you see them? Go to Greenfield Community College. We have a geology path there, right at the front of the school, actually. As you go along the front of the school, the main building, you will see this path adjacent to the, uh, the faculty parking lot there. And the short path is very obvious in the armored mud balls. There's like six big quarried rocks right there that you can see. So there's that one right there, all lined up in a row. And this one right here that has a whole bunch just laying across the surface. Now, this rock needs to be cleaned off just to be sure that you realize this. There are, you can see armor of the temple sticking in here. This is right there, there, there. But there's also lichen on the rock and the lichen is uh, making it seem like there's other things there that it's just a surface coating. And uh, this rock right next to it, has one that's the size of a basketball that's right on the corner so that you can see one side and then eat into it as well. See, that's really special to have that two-dimensional view. And then there's a bunch of other ones here and a couple that aren't circled that are on the side for the vertical. So anyway, an amazing display right there along the uh, parking lot at GCC. So they're rare. Are they unique? Are they only in Franklin County? What do you think? Is this really true? Doesn't that sound like it's too good to be true? How could that just be true, really? Well, let's take a look at the answer to that. So these lithified, that means petrified, turned to stone, armored mud balls, they have been recorded in the geological literature in a few other places of the world. Places like Greenland, Spitsbergen, Grenadad, you know, all over the world, they have been noted However, these places are rural, remote, and they're probably not even visible today because of erosion. You know, if you see something in a coastal cliff and you note it in the geological literature, and you come back five years later, you probably can't even find it again. So therefore, the Franklin County lithophyte armor and mud balls are very likely the only ones. They're definitely the best ones because all the other pictures that I have ever seen are uh, not inspiring at all. You know, it's like a gray ball against a gray rock with a sand coating. Mm, not exciting. And they're also usually from the ocean so that they're not from a stream. You see, the thing about being in a stream is stream pebbles have a whole mix of rock types from the uh, drainage area up above. Whereas when you're in the ocean, all of a sudden you're restricted to the types of things that could possibly armor. In other words, you get sand. So the difference between the mud and the sand is not very dramatic. So ours are dramatic. They're the best ones. And they're certainly the only ones that are easily seen in the whole world today. So the making of armor mud balls, the mud, where is the mud coming from? Whenever you have mud, it tells you geologically that the area it accumulates is very quiet water, not turbulent. In other words, the ocean, not the beach, but deeper out. And then in lakes. So to understand Jurassic armored mud balls, let's look at some recent armored mud balls. 
to illustrate what was happening here in the Jurassic. So here's some examples. One of the best ones that I've ever seen is actually from um, a pretty famous artist, Will Sillen from Sunderland. And if you've been to the Benesky Museum, you've seen Will Sillen's artwork, you know, all around uh, the mezzanine there. And if you go to his website, willsillen.com, you'll be blown away by his landscapes. Just an amazing uh, artist. And he also has a degree in geology too. But in any event, he likes to go out west and hike and take pictures and we'll bring those back to his studio and then paint from the slides. So he was out here in Utah, a place called Factory Butte. And how many, is, how many of you have been to Factory Butte? Yes, I always ask that question and nobody has. <laughs> I haven't been there either. But there's Will Sillen walking up this canyon, this channel, um, dry stream bed in Factory Butte. And look what he found. These are about the size of a one foot size. Um, there's a little trail that goes right beside them. So he's walking along this trail and he looks around. And he says, oh my God, those are armored mud balls. So luckily he's from the valley. He knew about armored mud balls mm -hmm. and found them and photographed them. And this is one of the better um, pictures of the formation of armored mud balls that I've ever seen. Anyway, if you go another thousand feet up this stream, you see where the, the mud hadn't started to roll enough into a ball yet. It was just there kind of rippled up. And then after a while, you know, the sun comes out and they crumble away because these are not buried. This is what it looks like. This is an internet picture, but this is where he was. That's Factory Butte in the distance. And you can see that the mud erodes very quickly. Anytime you have muddy rocks, you get um, what's called badlands topography because it just erodes, 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 erodes. The water runs off, it doesn't sink in. And so you have all these closely spaced channels. So the mud, let's talk about getting mud. Quiet water, as you know, lakes or oceans. Well, if you look at Factory Butte, all that mud that's underneath a surface cap of sandstone, the cap on the top is sandstone. But this is an inland sea from the Cretaceous time, uh, about 100 million years or so ago. So if you look at a map, it's called the Western Interior Seaway here. So this area was um, accumulating mud deposits from that ocean. And so, as you see it today, it's being eroded, of course, and the sandy layers of the old ocean, they act as cap rocks protecting the mud underneath, but the mud is, like I said, so soft it erodes quickly, and then you get the armored mud balls occasionally, if you're lucky, and the mud rolls the right way. So, keep in mind that these are very short streams. Their drainage systems are extremely short, because if you had a long drainage system, are these balls going to last if they went another mile downstream? You know, they won't last. So you need to have those characteristics to make armored mud balls for the geological record. So now let's go back to the Jurassic and we'll look at the Connecticut Valley region. In the Connecticut Valley, back in Jurassic times, this was a rift valley and there were lakes in the rift valley. And being an atoll, let me tell you that the Connecticut Valley is along a major fault called the Eastern Border Fault. Has anyone ever heard of the Eastern Border Fault before? Okay. Has anybody ever crossed over the French King Bridge? All right. The French King Bridge crosses right over the Eastern Border Fault. And if you could see the geological map of the area, the region, that line of the fault goes from Keene, New Hampshire, a little bit north of Keene, all the way past New Haven, Connecticut. And it was a major down drop block as Pangea split, as you'll see in just a second. And the reason I'm mentioning this for Athol, because you guys have a fault, just like the big Eastern border fault is called, oh God, what is it? The Athol Fault. That's it, it's the Athol Fault. <laughs> and the Athol Fault um, goes right through Athol here, but, it didn't drop a big enough valley down to have all the sedimentary rocks like we have in the Connecticut Valley. Most of you know we get the dinosaur footprints, the armored mud balls, because of the sedimentary filling into that old rift valley as Pangea split. So when Pangea split, that's the old supercontinent, we had a big fault, as I just mentioned, the eastern border fault. 
there was the Athol Fault, but it didn't go down enough. So it was a little valley and it probably had dinosaur footprints and armored mud balls and who knows what, just like the Connecticut Valley. But it didn't get deep enough to have thousands of feet of sediment. And now all that's eroded away. And all you get is the fault break, but you don't get the sediment that used to be in the Rift Valley. I'm so sorry. <laughs> but anyway, so what are Rift Valleys? Rift Valleys, the stress of continental splitting gives you the rift. So look at where we are here in Pangaea. There's that little circle there for New England up there between Africa and North America. And of course that has split apart. And as it splits, you get these stretching stresses. Today we see this in Africa, the famous rift valleys of East Africa, a continent that is splitting apart. And you get lakes and you get sediment washing into the, the faulted valleys. So it's uh, just like what used to be here back during Jurassic times. And so here's a cross section of that type of situation. Down drop blocks, there's Mount Kilimanjaro over there <laughs> to the left. And if you were there in Ethiopia, looking across the Rift Valley, you'd see all these sediments that are there. And those sediments, as you probably know, record our very early ancestors from 200 some thousand years ago. Anyway, we have a, an intimate connection to Rift Valleys. And the Rift Valley I love to go to is Death Valley in California. Death Valley National Park, get there if you can. It's incredible. The summertime is not so inviting. It's just is really hot. But if you can get there at any other time of year, you're going right into a rift. The continent is pulling apart. How many people realize that? The western part of the continent is just pulling apart. I mean, here at Badwater, it's uh, what, almost 300 feet below sea level. Everybody's heard of Palm Springs. Palm Springs is just about at sea level. And if you go a little bit further south to the Salton Sea, you're down again a couple hundred feet or so below sea level. So it's amazing. We have areas below sea level right here in the United States. And the only reason the ocean can't get in is because there's either mountains or piles of sediment like from the Colorado River that have blocked the ocean from coming in. But pretty soon, you know where Baja California is, Right, that's a big active faulted zone that's ranching uh, to, to the north and also splitting apart. The ocean's coming in there, folks. So don't buy lowland property, right? <laughs> Make sure that you go um, a couple hundred feet above sea level anyway. That would be my suggestion for an investment. Anyway, go to Death Valley if you can get there. It's just a beautiful example of a rift valley. And so let's look at what washes in because we're concerned with mud here, right? If you're close to the mountains, you get gravel and sand. And then the mud is there in the lakes that are nearby. So if you want a mud ball, somehow you've got to get the mud up on the fan here, up on the fan so it can be eroded and tumbled along a stream bed. So here's what we're, well, first of all, I'm showing you here that if you're looking at the sediments of the Connecticut River Valley here, you find we have those reddish sediments and they're, they're the result of those lakes and the alluvial fan gravels. So that's what, what they look like today. But in the past, if you're here in the Jurassic, this is what the rift would have looked like. So there's the shoreline. If the shoreline, if you had, a, uh, this is climate driven basically, if you have wet conditions, the shoreline's gonna rise. So guess what that's gonna do to the mud? The mud's gonna come up over the alluvial fan and you get deposits of mud up there on the fan. And then if there's drier conditions, the uh, mud will be left behind to dry and get hard layers of mud up there closer to the mountains. And then you'll get some stream flows, you see that'll come down across those hard mud layers. And here's a couple of uh, panels from the cartoon page that you can have. Um, so a chunk of dry mud will fall into the stream. It will tumble, as I said before, pick up the armor and go downstream, hopefully deposited. Now, this is what the situation looks like. There's a great internet picture here from Israel that shows one of these mountain valleys in a semi-arid climate. 
And when there's a rainstorm, you'll get a flash flood. And this is typically what happens to form armored mud balls because you need a flood event to do the erosion and have enough deposits to bury the ball, but not carry it for miles and miles and miles downstream because they would get all you know, tumbled and broken and you would never see them again. And so here it is, it's rained up in the hills and there's the beginning, the front of the flash flood coming right towards those people. And so that's what happened here at Factory Butte in 2015 to give us those armored mud balls. Now here's the question. Do you think these will become lithified? Well, guess what? I asked my friend Will Sillen about this and he, I was really surprised at this, but he said he went back to this site several years later and nothing was visible. They were just gone. However, they could have been buried, right? But I don't think so. I, I think they're so fragile and the sun comes out, they're gonna, they're gonna fall away. And so let's review. First of all, are you still awake? Um, so what kind of a stream deposited the armored mud balls? Was it like the Connecticut River? No, you gotta have short drainages. You've gotta have the mud. So if it's a big stream, they just will never last. You need to have a semi-arid environment, small streams, small drainages, flash floods, because the longer streams will just um, destroy the armored mud balls. So rapid formation and deposition before a stream tumbling destroys these delicate structures. So the armored mud ball rocks give us a great example of these flash floods. And now what I'm gonna do is show you what this looks like in geology terms. When you look at a rock, how can you tell that it was a flash flood? And these rocks are absolutely great textbook quality examples of this process of having a flash flood, seeing the channel deposit, and then preserving it right there for you to see. And I will bet that unless you've had a geology course, you have absolutely no idea that this is happening, even if you appreciate armor mud balls but I'm gonna show you the details of this right now. And I'm really excited about this because it is such a great example. And let's go on here. Okay, first of all, when you look at this quarried rock, notice how the armored mud balls are right at the bottom along with bigger pieces, you know, pieces the size of your fist. That's a six inch ruler for scale. And so here's the ball, there's the pebble, now notice what happens here. The channel bottom is not a smooth depositional surface. You know, if you look at lake beds, for instance, you'll get layer by layer by layer by layer, nice flat contacts between the layers. But in a stream, the stream energy is rushing down the channel and it's scouring, right? It's scouring into what was there. It's making a channel shape, it's got a little hollow. But then as the energy dies away, then the bigger pieces are deposited. And then as the flood energy further dies away, you go from cobbles to pebbles to sand to fine sand, you know, coarse sand to fine sand. You'll get something called a graded bed, gradation by the size. So this roughly, uh, you know, two foot segment here did not take millions of years to be deposited not even hundreds of years, not even tens of years. This is an hour by hour event here of a flash flood coming down streams from the mountains during the Jurassic into the Rift Valley. And it just happened to roll some armored mud balls at the time and then the stream flood diminished and it deposited the layers as you see. Um, so this is one event and it's preserved in that quarried rock from Turnus Falls. And I think that's uh, an amazing teaching block right there. Okay, so here's a graded bed at Stop and Shop in Greenfield. Unfortunately, the soil has now covered this, so you can't see this anymore. It really needs to be shoveled off carefully and pressure washed. But if you take a look at this, you may notice that right here, there's some big pebbles, a couple of fists inside. And then as you go towards the knee up there, it diminishes to sand. And there's a couple of tiny armored mud balls there. 
Okay, so let me talk about the discovery of the Franklin County's Jurassic Armored Mud Ball. So here it is. I get a job. Yay. You know, you go through graduate school, and then you look for a job, and then you get one. And, um, and that's a real funny story, too, because I was number two on the list. I came out from California, took my interview, and got a rejection letter, <clears throat> and I felt pretty dejected. And then I got a phone call. The, the person that was number one had to not take that job because he had to get, uh, this was Vietnam War time, those of you who might remember that. And you may remember that you could be drafted unless you had an essential job. Well, he could, he was uh, about to be drafted. He had to sign a contract with a public school system. GCC could give a job offer, but it could not give a contract because this was June and the budget had not been approved. And therefore, your offer was just verbal. <laughs> and so, the gentleman that actually was number one uh, had to resign, and I happened to be number two. So there we go. How about that? Well, luck in life. Who knows? So um, anyway, I came to this area, and I obviously wanted to explore, and um, I found right by the river in Turnus Falls, there's Unity Park. There used to be an old bridge there between Gill and Turnus Falls. Now, just to show you where that is, here's the... Uh, Google Earth map, and there was an old bridge right at that spot looking down here. Does anybody know where this is? You know where Unity Park is? You know where the barrels are across the river? Okay, that's roughly those safety barrels that they put out in the summertime. That's uh, roughly where the bridge is, or was, I should say. And I, this is my, me way back in 1970. Um, this is where I found the armored mud balls. Now, what is this thing? This is a suspension cable anchor. This was a suspension bridge. And of course the cables have to have a big anchor as opposed to a kind of like a normal bridge. And so I'm um, standing at this or scooching by this suspension cable anchor. Now, this is what it looked like. Here's an old photo from 1936. And I often wondered why nobody ever found these before, because the best sample that you've seen a few pictures of is on the right hand bridge abutment or suspension cable anchor. And I often wondered why nobody noticed this, because, you know, the one we just analyzed with the flood, it is so dramatic. But it's uh, when I saw this picture from 1936, I realized why Unity Park today is all filled in. There's a parking area. But at the time when, uh, most of the time here that the bridge was in existence, notice how it drops off on the right there. Can you see all the trees? I mean, probably nobody could ever see a rock that was in the middle of this abutment uh, up near the top. You know, it would be up in the trees, probably 10 feet above the riverbank. No, it's a, no, it's, it's just kind of a faded out picture. <clears throat> so I'm standing here at that picture of the previous picture that you saw. And they're, the armored mud balls are nice there. But if those were the only ones that were ever to be seen, it would not be spectacular enough to make anybody very exciting. The one that's really great is this one that you just saw. It's now on the GCC uh, geology path. But it was up there on that abutment to the right. And that's why nobody ever found it. It's because Unity Park wasn't filled in like that. So, as I say here, this important rock would have been extremely hard to see until Unity Park was filled in and created. So anyway, save the armor mud balls project, please. Let's save them. These are rare. And, this, and I wanna make them, um, they're proposed to be anyway, a state sedimentary structure. Jurassic armor mud balls would be a state sedimentary structure. Now, what that means is they call them state symbols. It's not gonna be on the flag, but there are 50 state symbols that kind of represent what's unique about Massachusetts. And as this show tells you here, there's the Boston cream donut and uh, the corn muffin and um, you know, 50 other things. 
And the armored mud balls are certainly more important than those things. And they're more unique. Everybody can make a corn muffin, but you can't make an armored mud ball from the Jurassic. So these are very unique. They're really fun things. And just to quickly review, why are they so rare? I often get asked that. Well, why don't we find these all over the place? Well, you need to have the lake beds to get the mud and you have to have dry conditions and land uplift to get the mud layers dry, hard, and then you have to, have to be eroded. You have to have short drainage systems. You have to have flash floods. You have to do the process to get them tumbled. You have to have to be quickly buried. Number five now, I'm up there in case you're ever read, you're reading this. <laughs> then they have to be uplifted and eroded to expose the rocks. And then you need a quarry to remove the rock layers. And then the quarry blocks have to be placed so that those round balls can be seen. And then somebody's got to discover them, publicize them and save them. So anyway, this is such a unique series of events that I think that we should all be excited about them and tell our legislators that they should become an official structure. So as I said earlier, you can get the cartoon of the armored mud ball story right here. And if you want to see them, go to Greenfield Community College, go to Unity Park. You can see them. Uh, these three blocks there are Unity Park. The other one on the far right, the Gill side of the river, just across the river there, has a bigger remaining structure of the uh, suspension cable anchor. In fact, you can still see the wires of the cable coming out of the top of it. And these are a little bit harder to see, but as the arrow is pointing to, you can still see armored mud balls in that suspension cable anchor as well. Well, as a promotion for this program, I mentioned that there's the death of a bowling alley and a lucky lunch at the best field trip location in the county. And I have to explain that. And I'm almost done in case you're freezing in this room here. I'm almost done. So you can get up and stretch, buy a t-shirt. <laughs> uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, here's what I mean by that. In Greenfield, there was a bowling alley called Simone's Bowling Alley until about the 1980s, I think. And then now it's Super Stop and Shop. Anyone been there? Okay. So, the Google Earth view on the left shows you Turner's Falls and then Greenfield and then the Connecticut River in between. And the little red circle shows you where that location is. A close-up is over here on the right, looking down, once again, from the Google Earth view. Well, when they were going to, they took down the bowling alley and they were going to build the new store. Well, they initially wanted to put the store on one side of the lot, uh, down here towards uh, the south. But there's houses here, and the people in those houses did not want to have the back of the store adjacent to their property. And so... Stop and Shop had to move the store to the other side of their property. And this was so fortuitous because when they did that, they had to make a 3D rock cut here at the back of the store. So the store is cut into, that back edge is cut into like a 20-foot section of the local geology, cut like a pie in two different directions. And geologically, this is really, really interesting because not only do you go through the layers, but you can go along the layers. You see on the same geographic spot, you see the cross-section view, but you can also follow them along the layers. So geologists, every field trip with geologists that comes to this area stops there at Stop and Shop. Well, Stop and Shop is also a place where you can get lunch in a bathroom and find a good place to park. So this is one of the best field trip sites in the world. So I'm leading my class here. And over in one corner, there's a place to have lunch. So I've been there for several years previously, and I'm up there eating lunch. And all of a sudden, I look where I'm sitting, and I'm like, my God, you know, I'm sitting on armored mud balls <laughs> right there, literally having my sandwich on an armored mud ball. And it turns out to be right with that the woman with the red coat here, on that little knob of rock right there. Uh, you saw a picture earlier, but there are our mud balls right there. I couldn't believe it. I was sitting on our mud balls having my lunch on a field trip. Is it that one that's coming up now? Or? Yeah, 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 yeah. And unfortunately, you see those trees 
they have kind of moved in and taken over that knob. And so if you go to the top there, the soil over the top and the sap on the rock. But if you look down in here, you can still see some armored mud balls and mud chunks that haven't quite been armored. So it's a still a great location to go. And on the backside, just giving you too much information here, but on the backside of Stop and Shop, over by the loading docks, there is one armored mud ball. I don't know how this ever worked out because you think that if they're gonna make armored mud balls in that stream, they would do more than just one. But there is one armored mud ball about the size of your fist that's uh, by the guardrail, right about the height of the guardrail. So you can see one at the back of Stop and Shop. The best bunch was here, but unfortunately, like I said, they need to be cleaned off. They need some maintenance. So there they are right there, cute little armored mud balls. And they've been planed off by the glacier. So if you look at this, it's a great location because the glacial scratches go right over that rocky surface. So it's a beautiful spot, smooth right off. If you can look at this slight mud ball here, you can see that there's the lines of the scratches. See the lines going right across there? Glacial scratched armored mud ball. Wow. Okay, there's another one. Two, three chunks of mud that uh, you can see the pebbles all around them. And finally, the final concept I want to say about why these things are even more unique than I have just mentioned is yes, there's another aspect of this that makes them even more unique. And that is this where are mud balls found? Well, stop and shop is that first red dot. And then there's a quarry, a so called cheap side quarry in North Deerfield. That's the second red dot. Armored mud balls have been found in both of those locations. And the main place armored mud balls have been found was due to a quarry that used to be right along the main street of uh, Turnus Falls, Avenue A. There's buildings set into it now, so you don't see that old quarry anymore. But it came from Turnus Falls. Now, Turnus Falls is Jurassic, whereas the red dots there are Triassic. They're Upper Triassic. So there's about a, maybe a 500 million year time frame between one and the other. But they're still in the same spot on the Earth, just about. So it's absolutely incredible that... So if you look at the cross-section, see there's the Triassic and there's the Jurassic. And in between that black line in between is the lava flow that makes up the spine of the Deer, of the uh, Connecticut River Valley today. There's a basalt layer there, a lava flow layer. And so in the Triassic, um, armor mud balls were forming. And then we had a lava flow. And then with, there's some lakes in between there as well. And then we have Turnus Falls sediment coming in with armor mud balls also 500 million years later. And they're all coming in. Armored mud balls are coming in to the same spot on the surface of the earth, even though we have 500,000 years of lava flow and lakes in between. Like, whoa, this is absolutely incredible. Yes. Yeah, I, uh, the Deerfield basalt is a great time marker because basalt and other igneous rocks have radioactive minerals in them. And when you date, the minerals in the Deerfield basalt, it's 201 million years old, which is right about at the beginning of the Jurassic time. And so in conclusion, save the rare armored mud balls. Uh, we're really lucky to have them and they really deserve official celebration and designation as a state sedimentary structure. And really that's the only way they're gonna be preserved for posterity. And so you can read about them in my little cartoon story here, thanks to my nephew. And um, uh, it's actually in process now, thanks to Susanna Whips, if anybody knows Susanna Whips. Um, but uh, she, she was nice enough to get real excited about these. And she and her office submitted the bill in the legislative pile for this session of the legislature. You can only do this every other year. And so this is our, you know, roughly two year time frame to have the legislature deal with this. Now, people in Franklin and Hampshire uh, County know a lot about the armor mud balls. The problem is breaking into the eastern part of the state. And um, it's tough to, to break in there to the news media. 
but that's a whole nother story. But hopefully uh, there'll be enough energy and enthusiasm that there'll be co-sponsors to this and there'll be a hearing and it'll be voted positively and we'll have a new state motto here, a Jurassic Armored Mud Ball sedimentary structure. Thank you very much. What has been seen cannot be unseen. And I'm here for questions. Yes. Yeah, so the question is, does any other state have a, an official sedimentary structure? The answer is no, but after this has been proposed, one of my colleagues down in uh, Virginia is thinking about getting a sedimentary structure for their state. Uh, yeah, yeah, we went round and round trying to figure out, well, what are we going to call them? Armored mud balls is you know, too specific. So let's just call them the state sedimentary structure. Our state sedimentary structure will be Jurassic armored mud balls. Just, well, I'm, I'm ignoring the Triassic one because the best one is Jurassic and everybody knows Jurassic. See, that's thanks to the, uh, the movies. Everybody knows Jurassic and the best ones are Jurassic. But um, yeah, so they are also in the upper Triassic. But no, almost nobody knows that except you about that. Um, yes, other questions? I had this class here in 1974. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not lying. I do remember the different ages across the Connecticut River. Okay, well, I have a supporter. This is for the Zoom people at home. A supporter from the back of the room. Remembers <laughs> Armored Mud Balls from 1970. Great, great. Yes. Uh, the mud balls and turners, the bridge structure, do you know where they were mined? Yeah, um, just very generally. Um, so the question is, where were the ones and turners quarried? Um, there's a woman who um, lives in Guild, Terry Rice, who did some research on this and discovered that there were small quarries along Avenue A. And today you can see the rocky outcrops along Avenue A. Uh, but there are buildings built into them. So if they were small quarries, you know, they would be taking rocks out that might be 10 feet uh, in, a, in a quarry face. And then, of course, today, that makes a great spot for a parking lot in an apartment building. So they've just been built into. So, uh, well, they might have been deeper too. Yeah. But I have, uh, I've looked at that whole section along there, and you can find um, some outcrops today that have small mud balls in them, but that was such a sweet spot right there when they took those out with those big ones like you saw. I mean, that was so special right along there because they're not common. They're just not common at all. And then to have the quarry in the spot where they were, uh, I mean, lucky, lucky, lucky. What can you say? Just lucky. Okay. Are there any other questions? Yes. One more. Yeah. If they are made this Massachusetts official state sedimentary structure, um, will they have protected status that they don't have now? Um, I do not think that there's any protective status that comes with them. Uh, I, I don't, I've never heard that asked before. So, will they be protected is the question. And I think making them an official sedimentary structure will just highlight what they are and be an educational aspect to them. It might cause them to be shot out. Uh, yeah, well, you do have to, to be careful of that because we don't, I mean, they are so rare. We don't want someone going in there with a rock saw and just, you know, hacking them off. So, yeah, that's a, definitely, that's a concern. Yeah. One, last One more question. Yes. Yeah. General vicinity of where we're at now, as far as Oh, okay, that's a good question. Sure. Actually, it's not that it's not that hard a question. Believe it or not, that's a really great question, and it sounds like it should be really hard to answer. So, for the people in the audience, the question is: Well, where were we in the Jurassic? Basically, what was our latitude? Uh, we can't tell about longitude, so we don't know where we were around the world, but we know where we were north to south. And this all comes from the lava flow, by the way. When the lava solidifies, 
there's uh, magnetic minerals in the lava and they get magnetized by the Earth's magnetic field. And you've all seen, you know, the Earth's magnetic field with all those force lines that go sometimes kind of flat at the equator and then almost vertical at the North Pole and the South Pole. You know, they kind of draped out like that. Well, if you parse that magnetic direction out of the magnetic minerals that are in the chunk of lava that you've taken out of the outcrop, you can figure out how those were magnetized and what their angles were. And that relates to your latitude. And so the latitude that 201 million years ago was around 15 degrees north. Now that puts us down in central Mexico, right? So that's where we were. And of course, keep in mind that we were not here within a hundred miles of the ocean. We were in the middle of Pangaea. So we were a landlocked, uh, you know, Kansas <laughs> within, the, within the country. So. Uh, great question. I'm glad I could answer that relatively easily. Okay, so um, for everybody in Zoom, I'm going to say that I'm concluding, and I'll call Max back, I guess, if you have some final comments, and I'll be glad to talk to anybody by email, and that, that includes the audience here as well. Okay. I'm not sure I can do that. There we go. Right. Okay. Oh, that's right. There's my website. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. Well, I know it's freezing in here today. I don't know how you are. I'm standing up and getting some food, but how are, how are you doing? Uh, yeah. So, uh, here's what I'm going to do here. Get through some take materials, ask some questions. Just keep social distancing and um, everything will be copacetic. Thank you so much for coming today. And let's say hooray to Ruth Shaw. I mean, yep. she was stuck here. Okay. Okay. Is Do I have a petition? Um, actually, uh, I did not bring a petition. Uh, I have a petition on my website. I'd like to encourage people to go to the website. You can sign the petition on the website. It's a tiny bit annoying because it takes a little bit more time to get into it, but you can leave your comment right there, which everybody can see. So when legislators 